Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to um, thank you again, Mrs. Rajavi, for your leadership and your organization of this now very urgent and very uh, dangerous uh, situation that we addressed this morning. I want to also thank and salute uh, the European parliamentarians and leaders here who I've known now for some time in this, uh, in this important endeavor. Uh, your leadership and your political courage uh, has been very critical and very instrumental here. And it's my hope that uh, your counterparts, not so much in the legislature of the United States, where we have very strong support for these goals, but in our executive department, particularly in the White House and the State Department, that uh, they follow uh, your lead here because they have been late uh, in getting to these issues of grave importance and requires uh, redoubled attention and immediate efforts. The goal here is the protection and safety of those 3,400 residents. That's our primary goal. There are, as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, equally important long-term objectives. But the immediate goal is the protection of these innocent uh, and very brave men and women. We have more than sufficient cause for alarm, evidence, and predicates uh, to act and to act here very swiftly. We need to have uh, United Nations uh, blue helmets, as we call them, on the ground at Camp Ashraf. Uh, I was very pleased to see our president uh, uh, perhaps a little slowly, but finally uh, getting aboard with respect to the objectives uh, in Libya. Uh, I was very pleased last week uh, that our president is sending 100 special forces to Africa to assist with the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, these are great objectives, uh, but the critical objective here, which is not unknown to our president or our secretary, uh, we have not gotten a response. We have gotten uh, delays and excuses uh, from the Department of State. Over 14 months ago, uh, a court, Court of Appeals, which is a fairly high court in Washington, D.C., found that the State Department had broken the law with respect to the process by which they've maintained MEK on the foreign terrorist organization list. And they found that uh, the State Department had broken the law they directed our Secretary of State to not only review the designation, but to tell the court what were the facts and on what sources did the State Department rely to continue this designation. The State Department, over 14 months later, uh, has made no response. We get silence and delay. And again, ladies and gentlemen, it's my firm belief, as I regret to say it, uh, that there is no factual response, there's no legal response, uh, there are political reasons uh, which require, unfortunately, this very dangerous uh, maintenance. And the political reasons have been alluded to by my colleagues, and it's, uh, it's appeasement. Uh, it's appeasement that does go back to the hostage taking. It goes back to the, uh, the coal bar bombing. So uh, we need our State Department to act. Uh, we need our Secretary to focus on this danger. Uh, and that, ladies and gentlemen, as I've been saying, is very, very frustrating. It was only a few weeks ago, eight or ten weeks, uh, that our Secretary of State and Department of State finally decided that they were going to actively oppose uh, the Assad regime in Syria, uh, killing thousands and thousands of innocent protesters, freedom fighters. Uh, so they're 14 years late on the MEK listing. Uh, and we know that appeasement doesn't work. It doesn't work with this regime. Uh, it didn't work in 1933 with Nazi Germany. And I just close by, uh, by saying that we have very clear notice here. Uh, the United States, you know, is not exempted from the responsibility of another Srebrenica here uh, because it hasn't made a decision on the delisting. Uh, they have, as you've heard, a moral and written legal obligation to each of those residents to protect them. Uh, but the United States, uh, our President and Secretary of State, who I greatly respect, are on clear notice here. 
Uh, it's important for the secretary to go to Tripoli. We understand that. Uh, but she needs to focus on this issue immediately. Uh, the United Nations needs the support of the United States to get this done. Uh, and the European Union, I'm sure, could use the support and resources of the United States to get this done. So um, we have very little time. We have urgent uh, dangers here. Uh, and I applaud, again, the European leadership and Mrs. Rajavi, your leadership here, uh, to get this done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I, it's a good feeling uh, to be back in this committee room where I was grilled regularly over a period of more than 10 years. But it's a not so good feeling to be back in this committee meeting room and to have to complain, really to complain, about the lack of commitment and action uh, also on our side, the European side, uh, when dealing uh, with the humanitarian challenge of Camp Ashraf. It doesn't matter what you think about Iran. It doesn't matter what you think about the government in Iraq, what you think about MEK, what you think about Madame Rajavi. What matters here is uh, that there are people uh, in this Camp Ashraf since 1986, and these people need protection. When we were here in Brussels, a couple of weeks ago, uh, for the first time, to deliver this message in a press conference, we have asked the European institution to appoint a special envoy. And I'm very happy to say that this is done, but it is not, it is not sufficient. Much more needs to be done. I agree with my colleagues here from the European Parliament uh, that it is absolutely important to create the strongest possible international pressure and that therefore the 27 member states of the uh, EU must, must take action and must intervene uh, wherever and whenever they can. But this action must be coordinated and the, we have to speak with one voice. And this is the responsibility of the, of the European institutions, here in particular uh, the responsibility uh, of the Commission uh, and, and, the, and the Council. They have, they have to create a common position and to present this common position in a clear and open dialogue. First, with the government in Baghdad, telling the government there that they cannot expect the European taxpayers to pay billions and billions for the reconstruction of this country, of the government, if the government of this country does not respect human rights. We must make that very clear uh, that how they deal with Cap Ashraf will cost them will cost them very dearly. Number two is to discuss it with the United States. The two issues are clearly linked, the problem of Camp Ashraf and the way how we deal with MEK, or the democratic opposition uh, in Iran. We have here heard from uh, my neighbor and friend Louis, Louis Free that we have a broad coalition in the United States making this case. This is the most unlikely coalition you can imagine. And I really ask the question, how many people does Secretary Clinton need? Outstanding Americans who served, who served their country in top positions in the security area, in the law enforcement area, in the political arena, Senate, Congress, uh, as governors, as mayors. How many outstanding American citizens does Secretary Clinton need to take her decision and to review uh, the terribly wrong decision in 1997 to put MEK on the list of terrorist organizations as a part of a political maneuver and nothing else that, as we know, went terribly wrong. This has to be discussed with the United States. It has to be uh, part of our dialogue. And number three, it has to be part of our dialogue within the system of the United Nations, the Secretary General of the United Nations, the High Commissioner for Refugees and the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights, to make clear that the United Nations understand the situation there as a responsibility of um, the international, international community. We need to get a clear decision uh, from the United Nations, our people in Camp Ashraf uh, will get a secure status, will be recognized 
uh, recognized uh, as refugees uh, and can find uh, exile wherever they want. The special envoy that I have already mentioned, that is the most welcome development, and uh, I, uh, I wish him, I wish him very well. Uh, here it's important uh, to make sure that he can uh, visit Camp Ashraf without delay, uh, and we cannot accept. We cannot accept uh, if the government in Baghdad uh, would uh, create obstacles for his work, would deny him, would deny him access or whatever, whatever he needs. So this is uh, an issue of the uh, utmost urgency uh, for the European um, uh, diplomacy, and I would go so far to say uh, this is indeed a kind of a kind of test case. Finally. Uh, my colleagues here have already linked the two questions, the Kamberschraft situation and the problem of uh, the uh, regime in Iran and the threat the regime in Iran means, means for us. I join those uh, who clearly say that MAK uh, is the democratic opposition uh, in Iran and it's the best hope we have, the, in my view, the only hope, the only hope we have uh, to uh, overcome uh, this Mullah regime and uh, to prevent it uh, from creating uh, more disaster in the world as they have already, as they have already done. There are people uh, telling us uh, that uh, MEK is a terrorist organization. Well, I think the issue must not be further discussed here after all the evidence uh, we have seen. Uh, there are other people claiming that MEK is not a democratic organization, but these people bother, don't bother to give evidence. They don't give evidence for that. I can only say from, from my personal experience uh, with the representatives, in particular with the leader, uh, Madame Rajavi, uh, that the uh, credibility uh, of uh, MEK uh, as a democratic opposition movement that fully shares uh, our European values uh, and would be our best and strongest ally uh, in this uh, most dangerous place in our in our neighborhood. Uh, that MK would be would be such an ally, and that we do everything uh, in order to support them. Thank you.